You're listening to Audiology. Support this channel by becoming a member and be sure to submit your request for topics in the comments below. In the 18th century, different tribal groups from the southeastern United States, including the Alabamas, Choctaw, Yamasees, Yukis, and Creek people, moved into the untamed lands of Florida. The Creek, being the largest of these groups, was divided into lower and upper creeks with Hitchite and Muscogee speakers among them. A faction of Hitchite speakers known as the Miccosukee settled near today's Lake Miccosukee near Tallahassee. Another settled in the region known today as Alachua County. The Spanish in St. Augustine began referring to these Alacua Creeks as Cimarrones, meaning wild ones or runaways. This term is believed to be the root of the name Seminole, which was later used to describe all groups in Florida, despite their distinct tribal identities. At the time of the Seminole Wars, there were also groups identified as Spanish Indians, believed to be descendants of the Calusa, and Rancho Indians, who were of mixed Native American and possibly Spanish ancestry living in fishing camps along the Florida coast. These groups, including those at Tampa Bay, initially found refuge but were ultimately forced onto reservations. After the Treaty of Paris returned East and West Florida to Spanish control, the United States disputed the boundaries of West Florida and accused Spain of not stopping fugitive slaves and Native Americans in Florida from raiding U.S. territory. This led to the U.S. occupying and annexing parts of West Florida, starting in 1810 and culminating in the First Seminole War, led by Andrew Jackson in 1818. The Adams-Onis Treaty of 1819, where Spain ceded Florida to the United States, which then took control in 1821, only increased pressure to move the Seminoles. By 1823, the U.S. government negotiated the Treaty of Moultrie Creek creating a central Florida reservation for the Seminoles, but allowing six chiefs to keep their villages along the Apalachicola River. Despite moving to the reservation, the Seminoles and European Americans experienced friction, leading to repeated U.S. calls for their removal. The Seminoles resisted moves to join them onto Creek reservations, wishing to remain in Florida, which they considered their home. Tensions over runaway slaves whom the Seminoles integrated further inflamed relations. Black Seminoles established separate communities, yet close alliances persisted between them and the Seminole, posing a threat to the institution of slavery in the eyes of many slaveholders. The situation worsened with the election of Andrew Jackson and the passage of the Indian Removal Act in 1830. The Treaty of Payne's Landing in 1832 proposed the relocation of the Seminoles to the West if the land was deemed suitable. However, many chiefs later denied signing the treaty or claimed coercion creating disputes over its legitimacy. In 1834, with the Senate's ratification, the government expected the Seminoles to move by 1835, leading to the reinforcement of military personnel and tensions escalating with Seminole leaders. Osceola emerged as a vocal opponent, especially against the prohibition of arms sales to Seminoles, equating such measures to treating them as slaves. Despite initially locking up Osceola to enforce the treaty, he was later released on the agreement to comply, marking a temporary resolution. However, the assault on Seminoles by European Americans and subsequent violence, including the killing of mail carrier Private Kinsley Dalton and the murder of Chief Charlie Amathla by Osceola for intending to move west, signaled the collapse of peace and the stirring of more profound conflict. As tension mounted with the understanding that the Seminoles were not going to move without a fight, Florida braced itself for conflict. The St. Augustine militia reached out to the War Department, requesting the use of 500 muskets. In response, 500 volunteers were gathered under the leadership of Brigadier General Richard K. Call to face the Seminole resistance. Indian raiding parties attacked farms and settlements, pushing families to seek refuge in forts, large towns, or flee the territory entirely. In a daring move, Osceola and his group intercepted a Florida militia supply train, killing eight guards and injuring six, although most of the stolen goods were later reclaimed by the militia in a subsequent skirmish. Sugar plantations to the south of St. Augustine along the Atlantic coast were laid to waste, with many slaves from these plantations joining the Seminoles. The U.S. Army, with roughly 550 soldiers across 11 companies, had a modest presence in Florida. At Fort King, a single company of soldiers was stationed, raising concerns about their ability to defend against a Seminole attack. With three companies at Fort Brooke and two more on the way, 
it was decided to send two companies, or 110 men, to reinforce Fort King. Led by Major Francis L. Dade, these men left Fort Brooke on December 23, 1835. For five days, they were closely followed by Seminoles, who then ambushed Dade's command on December 28, resulting in the loss of all but three men, an event now known as the Dade Massacre. Of the survivors, only Private Edwin de Courcy was killed by a Seminole the next day, while Privates Ransom Clark and Joseph Sprague made it back to Fort Brooke. Clark, who died five years later from his wounds, left a detailed account of the battle, but no written accounts from Sprague have been found. The Seminoles suffered three dead and five wounded. On the same day as this ambush, Osceola and his followers killed Wiley Thompson and six others outside Fort King. In February, Major Ethan Allen Hitchcock found himself among those who stumbled upon the remains of Dade's command. He voiced his criticism of the conflict in his journal, firmly stating that the government's unjust actions and enforcement of a fraudulent treaty were to blame for the Seminoles' staunch defense of their land. He lamented the forced war upon the natives due to governmental tyranny. On December 29th, General Clinch set out from Fort Drain with 750 soldiers including 500 volunteers, toward a Seminole stronghold. However, upon reaching the Withlacoochee River, they were attacked by Seminoles, managing to survive by charging with fixed bayonets. This encounter resulted in four soldiers killed and 59 wounded. Following this, on January 6, 1836, Seminoles attacked William Cooley's Kuanti plantation, killing his family and causing residents in the surrounding areas to flee to Key West. Later, a clash south of St. Augustine led to further volunteer casualties. Concluding these violent exchanges, the Navy's sloop of war Vandalia was sent to Tampa Bay, and 57 U.S. Marines were deployed from Key West to support Fort Brooke, marking a continued escalation in the fight against the Seminole resistance. At the time, the American Army was quite small, having fewer than 7,500 soldiers spread across 53 posts. Their duties varied from guarding the Canada-U.S. border and managing coastal defenses to relocating Native Americans westward and then monitoring their separation from white settlers. Whenever there was a sharp need for more troops, state and territory militias, along with volunteer groups that formed themselves, stepped in to fill the gap. As word of the conflict spread, a flurry of responses ensued. Major General Winfield Scott took command of the operations while Congress allocated $620,000 for the war effort. Volunteer units started to form in Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. General Edmund P. Gaines assembled a mix of 1,100 regular soldiers and volunteers in New Orleans, taking them by sea to Fort Brooke. Upon arriving, Gaines discovered that Fort Brooke was running low on supplies. Convinced that General Scott had directed supplies to Fort King, Gaines led his force there. En route, they stumbled upon the site of the Dade Massacre, where they buried the fallen in three large graves. The journey to Fort King took nine days, only to find shortages there as well. After receiving a week's rations from General Clinch at Fort Drain, Gaines turned his men back towards Fort Brook. Wanting to make his efforts count, Gaines chose a different path back, hoping to confront the Seminoles in their stronghold along the cove of the Withlacoochee River. However, Due to unfamiliarity with the terrain, Gaines's party ended up at a previously contested spot on the Withlacoochee River, and it took them an extra day to locate a crossing while exchanging fire with the Seminoles. As they attempted to cross at the Withlacoochee Ford, Lieutenant James Izzard was hit and later succumbed to his injuries, and General Gaines was also struck by a bullet. Unable to cross the river or return to Fort King due to lack of provisions, Gaines's troops built a defensive position named Camp Izzard and sent for help from General Clinch, hoping to trap the Seminoles by coordinating with Clinch's forces. However, General Scott, overseeing the war efforts, initially ordered Clinch to stay put at Fort Drain. With supplies running critically low, Gaines's men were forced to resort to consuming their horses, mules, and occasionally dogs as they engaged in an eight-day battle. Despite being ordered to stay, Clinch decided to defy General Scott, setting off to aid Gaines just a day before Scott's approval arrived. Clinch's forces arrived at Camp Izzard on March 6, driving off the Seminoles. General Scott had set in motion an ambitious plan to defeat the Seminole. He organized a strategy where 5,000 men, split into three groups, would surround the Seminoles in the cove of the Withlacoochee to prevent their escape. Scott would join forces with General Clinch's column which would advance south from Fort Drain.
Another group, led by Brigadier General Abraham Eustace, was to head southwest from Volusia, located along the St. John's River. The last group, guided by Colonel William Lindsay, planned to approach from the north starting at Fort Brook. The goal was for these columns to coordinate their arrival, trapping the Seminoles from all sides. Eustace and Lindsay aimed to be in position by March 25th, setting the stage for Clinch to push the Seminoles towards them. On his journey from St. Augustine to his starting point in Volusia, General Eustace encountered Pilaklikaha, also known as Abraham's Town, named after its leader Abraham, a black Seminole and former member of the Corps of Colonial Marines. Despite Abraham's critical role as a leader and interpreter for the Seminoles during the Second Seminole War, Eustace decided to burn the town before moving to Volusia. However, plans did not unfold as intended. Eustace was delayed in leaving Volusia by two days due to a Seminole attack. Clinch and Lindsay only managed to reach their designated positions by March 28th. Due to the challenging terrain, Eustace's group didn't arrive until March 30th. Clinch had already attempted an attack on March 29th, finding the villages empty. Although Eustace's men engaged in a minor skirmish with some Seminoles, the effort led to minimal captures or casualties among the Seminole. By March 31st, with supplies running low, all three groups retreated to Fort Brooke. The campaign was deemed a failure, attributed to the lack of preparation time and the difficulties posed by the climate. This setback was seen as a significant defeat in their efforts to subdue the Seminoles. The year 1836 was a tough one for the Army, facing aggressive attacks by the Seminoles. These attacks included strikes on several forts, like Camp Cooper, Fort Alabama on the Hillsborough River, Fort Barnwell, and even Fort Drain itself. Not stopping there, the Seminoles also destroyed the sugar operations on Clinch's plantation. This led to Clinch stepping down from his position and exiting the territory, and by the end of April, Fort Alabama was left deserted. The following month saw more setbacks, with Fort King being abandoned in late May and a dramatic rescue of soldiers from a blockhouse on the Withlacoochee River in June, after they were under siege by the Seminoles for a lengthy 48 days. A particularly bold attack occurred on July 23rd when Seminoles targeted the Cape Florida Lighthouse, leaving it in ruins until it was repaired in 1846. Fort Drain was also vacated in July due to a significant outbreak of illness among the soldiers. With the Army deeply affected by disease and facing ongoing challenges, Congress decided to invest another $1.5 million into the war effort, allowing for the enlistment of volunteers who could serve up to a year. Richard Keith Call, leading the Florida Volunteers and newly appointed as the governor of Florida in March 1836, suggested a summer offensive using militia and volunteers rather than relying on regular army forces. Despite agreement from the War Department, delays meant this campaign couldn't kick off until the end of September. Call's plan involved an attack on the cove of the Withlacoochee, but logistical challenges, including a crucial supply issue when the steamer sank, led to another unsuccessful attempt against the Seminoles. Not giving up, Call made another attempt in mid-November, this time successfully crossing the Withlacoochee and finding the cove abandoned. Following a strategic division of his forces and a skirmish on November 17th, Call pursued the Seminoles into the Wahoo Swamp. Despite initial success, the advance was halted by a challenging crossing and the death of Major David Moniak, a significant figure and possibly the first Native American to graduate from West Point. Facing difficult odds and dwindling supplies, Call had no choice but to retreat. By December 9th, Call was replaced by Major General Thomas Jessup, who led the troops back to Fort Brooke. As December ended, so did the enlistments of the volunteers, closing this chapter of their service. Back in 1836, the U.S. Army was led by just four major generals. Alexander Macomb, Jr. was at the helm as the commanding general. Meanwhile, Edmund Gaines and Winfield Scott both tried and failed to overcome the Seminoles. It was up to Thomas Jessup, fresh from quelling a revolt by the Creek tribes in western Georgia and eastern Alabama, to take a shot at it. In what's known as the Creek War of 1836, Jessup managed to outshine Scott, bringing a whole new strategy to the table in fighting the Seminoles. Instead of pursuing large-scale confrontations, Jessup aimed to gradually wear down the Seminole resistance. This strategy required a hefty military force stationed in Florida, eventually amassing over 9,000 soldiers under his command, including volunteers, militia, a brigade of Marines, as well as personnel from the Navy and the Revenue Marine, which is now known as the United States Revenue Cutter Service. 
For this effort, the Revenue Marine dedicated eight cutters to operations throughout Florida. From the onset of the conflict, both the U.S. Navy and the Revenue Marine were by the Army's side. Their ships and cutters transported troops and supplies to various Army locations. They also patrolled the Florida coastline to gather intelligence on Seminole movements, intercept them, and prevent smuggling of weapons and supplies to their ranks. Additionally, sailors and Marines were tasked with reinforcing Army forts that were understaffed. These forces even ventured into the heart of Florida, navigating its rivers and trekking through its lands on foot. In contrast to the massive force assembled by Jessup, the Seminoles began the war with a fighting force of between 900 and 1,400 warriors. With no way to replenish their numbers, the Seminoles were at a significant disadvantage. At the start of the conflict in 1836, it was estimated the Seminole population ranged from 6,000 to 10,000 individuals. In January 1837, the dynamics of the conflict shifted notably with several Seminoles and Black Seminoles either killed or captured. Notably, during the Battle of Hatchi Lusti, the Marine Brigade managed to take the enemy's horses and baggage, capturing around 25 individuals, mostly women and children. By the end of January, some Seminole chiefs sought peace approaching Jessup to discuss a truce. While skirmishes continued, it wasn't until the end of February that Jessup and the Seminole chiefs met face to face. In March, a significant agreement was crafted where chiefs, including McCanopy, consented to relocate west with their allies and their Negroes, their bona fide property. Despite the initial steps toward peace, the process was fraught with challenges. As Seminoles gathered in army camps preparing for relocation, slave catchers targeted the black Seminoles, exploiting the lack of formal ownership records to win disputes. Additionally, some sought to accuse Seminoles of crimes or debts. These incidents led Seminoles to doubt Jessup's promises. Curiously, many warriors arriving at the camps did not bring their families, showing more interest in the supplies offered than in permanent resettlement. By the end of May, a number of chiefs, including McCanopy, had surrendered. However, key leaders Osceola and Sam Jones remained defiant against relocation. In a daring move on June 2nd, these leaders and around 200 followers stormed into Fort Brooks' lightly guarded camp, rescuing 700 Seminoles who had surrendered. The large-scale conflict didn't immediately pick back up. General Jessup, assuming the substantial surrenders signaled the end of hostilities, hadn't prepared for a continued campaign. With the onset of summer, known as the sickly season, and the reassignment or discharge of many soldiers, military operations in Florida slowed. Additionally, the Panic of 1837 tightened government finances, although Congress did allocate an additional $1.6 million United States dollars for the war. In August, as a further indication of the changing circumstances, the Army ceased providing rations to civilians who had sought refuge in its forts, underscoring the ongoing challenges and complexities of the situation. General Jessup kept up the pressure on the Seminole people by deploying small military units. As a result, many African Americans living with the Seminoles started to surrender. After several changes in policy about handling escaped slaves, Jessup ultimately decided to send most of them west to reunite with Seminoles who had already been moved to Indian Territory. On the 10th of September, 1837, the Army and militia forces managed to capture a group of Miccosukee people, including a key chief named King Philip. The following night, they captured a group of Uchi people and their leader, Uchi Billy. Jessup then used King Philip to send a message to his son, Koakuchi, known as Wildcat, to come in for a meeting. When Koakuchi came under a promise of safety, Jessup arrested him. In October, Osceola and another chief, Koahadjo, asked for a meeting with Jessup. This meeting took place south of St. Augustine, and like Koakuchi, when Osceola and Koahadjo arrived, they too were arrested under what should have been a safe flag of truce. Osceola died in prison at Fort Moultrie in Charleston, South Carolina, just three months after his capture. However, not all captures were permanent. While still imprisoned at Fort Marion, also known as Castillo de San Marcos, in St. Augustine, 20 Seminoles, including Coacuchi and the black Seminole leader John Horse, managed to break out of their cell through a small window. Criticism followed Jessup's actions, as he clearly broke the rules of war respected by civilized nations. He spent the next 21 years trying to justify his actions, but as one quote puts it, undoubtedly the general violated the rules of civilized warfare, and he was still writing justifications of it 21 years later, 
for what is seen as an undeniable act of treachery. When the Cherokee were sent to encourage the Seminoles to move west, General Jessup went back on his word again. Even when Seminole leaders came in to talk with the Cherokee, Jessup took them into custody. John Ross, the Cherokee leader, objected, but Jessup dismissed it, saying he had already made it clear that no Seminole who came in would be allowed to return home. Jessup had gathered a huge army, pulling in volunteers from as far as Missouri and Pennsylvania. However, he found himself with so many men that feeding them became a problem. His strategy involved sweeping down the Florida Peninsula with several groups to push the Seminoles further south. General Joseph Marion Hernandez led a team down the East Coast. General Eustace took his group southward up the St. John's River, and Colonel Zachary Taylor moved from Fort Brooke into the central part of the state, heading south between the Kissimmee and Peace Rivers. Additional units cleared out areas between various rivers and along the Caloosahatchee River, while a combined Army-Navy team patrolled Florida's lower east coast, and other troops kept watch in the north to guard against Seminole attacks. The campaign's first significant clash came with Colonel Taylor. On December 19, leaving Fort Gardner with 1,000 men to head towards Lake Okeechobee, he saw 90 Seminoles surrender in the first two days. On the third day, Taylor paused to construct Fort Basinger, where he left the sick and guards for the surrendered Seminoles. By Christmas Day, 1837, Taylor and his men caught up with the main Seminole forces on Lake Okeechobee's north shore. The Seminoles, under the leadership of Alligator Sam Jones and the recently escaped Coacoochee, had a strong defensive position in a hammock surrounded by sawgrass. The area was muddy and the sawgrass could easily cut and burn skin. Taylor's force numbered about 800, while the Seminoles were fewer than 400. Initially, Missouri volunteers led the attack. Colonel Richard Gentry and three other officers, along with over 20 enlisted men, were killed, forcing a retreat. Then 200 soldiers from the 6th Infantry went in and suffered almost 40% casualties, including four officers, before they too had to withdraw. Finally, 160 men from the 4th Infantry, reinforced by the 6th Infantry and Missouri volunteers, managed to push the Seminoles from the hammock towards the lake. Taylor then attacked their flank with his reserve forces. Despite this, the Seminoles managed to escape across the lake, with only about a dozen of their number killed. Still, the Battle of Lake Okeechobee was celebrated as a significant victory for Taylor and his forces. General Taylor and his troops joined a larger operation, aimed at moving down the peninsula on the east side of Lake Okeechobee, all under the direction of General Jessup. Meanwhile, forces along the Caloosahatchee River made sure the Seminoles couldn't escape northwards on the lake's west side. Parallel to these efforts, a joint Army-Navy unit led by Navy Lieutenant Levin Powell was patrolling Florida's east coast. On January 15th, during the Battle of Jupiter Inlet, Powell led a group of 80 men towards a Seminole encampment but quickly found themselves outnumbered. Despite their aggressive move towards the Seminoles, they had to retreat losing four men and having 22 wounded, with their escape covered by Army Lieutenant Joseph E. Johnston. By the end of January, Jessup's forces had another encounter with the Seminoles east of Lake Okeechobee. Initially, the Seminoles held their position in a wooded area, but were pushed back across the Loxahatchee River due to heavy artillery fire. They made a stand again, but eventually disappeared, leaving behind more casualties on Jessup's side than theirs, effectively ending the Battle of Loxahatchee. The intensity of the conflict began to wane. By February 1838, Seminole leaders Tuskegee and Halleck Hadjo proposed to Jessup that they would cease hostilities if allowed to remain south of Lake Okeechobee. Jessup was inclined to accept, considering the prolonged effort it would take to remove the Seminoles from the Everglades and thinking it would be simpler to move them when the area became desirable to white settlers. However, he needed to get the go-ahead from Washington. While waiting for a response, the Seminoles set up camp near the Army's position, leading to some friendly interactions between the two groups. Yet when Jessup heard back, the news wasn't favorable. Secretary of War Joel Roberts Poinsett demanded the campaign continue, rejecting the peace offer. Jessup called for a meeting with the chiefs, who declined to show up. Knowing he couldn't let 500 Seminoles escape back into the swamps, Jessup ordered their detainment, encountering minimal resistance from the Seminoles, possibly due to their dwindling will to continue the conflict. Today, the Loxahatchee River Battlefield Park and memorials within Jonathan Dickinson State Park 
serve as reminders of these historic encounters. As the summer of 1838 approached, Jessup decided it was time to step down from his leadership role. By that time, the number of soldiers stationed in Florida had decreased to roughly 2,300. Come April, Jessup received orders to resume his duties as the quartermaster general of the army. The following month, Zachary Taylor, who had been promoted to general, took over the command of the army forces in Florida. With fewer troops at his disposal, Taylor focused on preventing the Seminoles from entering northern Florida. This strategy was meant to make it safe for settlers to return to their homes. Despite the reduced military presence, the Seminoles managed to launch attacks far into the north. In July, they were believed to have killed a family on the Santa Fe River, another near Tallahassee, and two families in Georgia. However, the conflict cooled down over the summer months as the soldiers retreated to the coasts, and the Seminoles turned their attention to farming and stockpiling resources for the upcoming cold season. Taylor's strategy to control the situation involved establishing small military posts throughout northern Florida, linked by wagon roads and conducting thorough searches of designated areas with larger troops. This approach required significant funds, which Congress agreed to provide. By October 1838, Taylor had managed to move the remaining Seminoles from along the Apalachicola River to the Indian Territory west of the Mississippi River. However, after some violent incidents near Tallahassee, Taylor had to redirect troops from the south to enhance security in northern Florida. The winter months passed relatively quietly. The army engaged in few conflicts with the Seminole, killing only a small number and relocating fewer than 200 to the west. On the Seminoles' side, they managed to kill nine U.S. troops. By the spring of 1839, Taylor reported significant progress. His troops had built 53 new posts and carved out 848 miles of wagon roads, a testament to their hard work and strategic planning in securing the area. In 1839, across Washington and the nation, public support for the ongoing conflict was waning. The need for soldiers in the Florida War had led to an increase in the Army's size, causing many to argue that the Seminole people had earned their right to remain in Florida. The escalating costs and time it would take to remove all Seminoles from Florida were becoming progressively apparent. To address this, Congress set aside $5,000 to seek a peaceful resolution with the Seminoles, aiming to stop the drain on resources. President Martin Van Buren appointed the Army's top general, Alexander Macomb, to work out a new treaty with them. However, wary of past betrayals, the Seminole were reluctant to engage. Eventually, Sam Jones appointed Chito Tustanugji as his representative to negotiate with Macomb. On May 19, 1839, Macomb announced an agreement. The Seminoles would cease hostilities in return for a reservation in southern Florida. As summer unfolded, this pact seemed effective, with minimal conflicts reported. A trading post was established on the Caloosahatchee River's north shore near what is now Cape Coral, where interactions with the Seminoles appeared amicable. Colonel William S. Harney led a group of 23 soldiers stationed at this post. However, on July 23, 1839, around 150 Indians, including known leaders Billy Bowlegs, Chakaika, and Hospetark, launched a surprise attack on the trading post and its military guard. While Colonel Harney and a few others managed to escape by boat, most of the soldiers and several civilians at the post were killed, reigniting the war. Confusion reigned over which group of Seminoles was responsible for this attack. Many accused the Spanish Indians under Chikaika, while others suspected Sam Jones and his Miccosukee group, despite their recent treaty. Jones offered to hand over those responsible to Harney within 33 days. Meanwhile, relations between the Miccosukee near Fort Lauderdale and the local soldiers remained cordial. On July 27th, they even invited officers from the fort to a dance, an offer declined by the officers who instead sent two soldiers and a black Seminole interpreter with a keg of whiskey as a goodwill gesture, only for those soldiers to be killed, confirming the involvement of Sam Jones and Chito Tustanugi in the hostilities. By August 1839, Seminole raiding parties were active as far north as Fort White, signifying a severe escalation in the conflict. The Army decided to deploy bloodhounds to help track down the Seminoles, a strategy initiated in 1838 when General Taylor got the green light to buy and test a pair of bloodhounds. However, these dogs, trained to follow the scent of enslaved Africans, showed no interest in tracking Seminoles, making the trial a failure. 
In a later attempt, the Florida government imported bloodhounds and their handlers from Cuba in 1840, but the results were inconsistent, and the public was alarmed at the thought of these dogs being unleashed on the Seminoles, especially vulnerable groups like women and children. To address these concerns, the Secretary of War insisted the dogs be muzzled and leashed. Despite these measures, the dogs struggled to track through water and were reluctant to follow the Seminoles' scent, identifying it as different from what they were accustomed to. Meanwhile, in northern Florida, despite General Taylor's use of blockhouses and patrols forcing the Seminoles to stay mobile, the army couldn't completely remove their presence. During this unrest, the Seminoles launched several deadly attacks, including ambushing a mail stage and attacking a theatrical group, resulting in numerous deaths. By May 1840, after serving longer than any previous commander in the Florida conflict, Zachary Taylor was succeeded by Brigadier General Walker Keith Armistead. Armistead initiated a proactive summer campaign, deploying 100 soldiers to search for Seminole camps, taking prisoners, and destroying resources to weaken the Seminoles, who remained combative, killing 14 soldiers in July alone. Armistead aimed to restrict the Seminoles to south of Fort King, leading efforts to destroy their bases and resources in central Florida, affecting a vast area of their crops. Armistead's relationship with the territorial government became strained, even as he called for 1,500 militiamen to secure the area north of Fort King and brought in additional army regiments to strengthen the military presence in Florida. Simultaneously, the Southern Front saw changes with Colonel Harney at Fort Bankhead prioritizing training in swamp and jungle warfare. The Navy also stepped up, conducting operations in rivers, streams, and the Everglades, marking a critical expansion in the role of the military in the conflict. At the beginning of the war, Navy Lieutenant Levin Powell led a combined force of Army and Navy personnel, along with eight revenue cutters and over 200 men. They operated along the coast to address the situation. Later, in 1839, Lieutenant John T. McLaughlin took charge of a similar joint force this time with additional support from the Revenue Marine. His mission involved using schooners, cutters off the coast, and smaller boats, even canoes, to block Cuban and Bahamian traders from supplying the Seminoles with arms and supplies. McLaughlin set up his base on Tea Table Key in the upper Florida Keys. In April 1840, McLaughlin's team tried to cross the Everglades from the west to the east. However, they encountered Seminoles at Cape Sable. While there were no deaths reported among the naval forces, Seminoles took their casualties with them. Many of McLaughlin's men fell ill. The mission was aborted and the sick were taken to Pensacola. For several months after, McLaughlin and his men explored southern Florida's inlets and rivers. McLaughlin did eventually lead a successful crossing of the Everglades. From December 1840 to mid-January 1841, his force navigated the Everglades from east to west using dugout canoes. This was noteworthy as they were the first group of white people recorded to complete such a crossing. Indian Key, nestled in the upper Florida Keys, was more than just a small island. It was a bustling hub for wreckers. In 1836, it marked a significant point in history by becoming the county seat for the newly established Dade County, and also served as a port of entry. Despite the looming threat of attacks and frequent sightings of Indians nearby, the island's residents stood their ground. Their determination was fueled by the desire to guard their homes and to stay close to potential shipwrecks in the area. Equipped with six cannons and their own militia, the islanders were prepared to defend themselves. Moreover, the Navy supported this resolve by setting up a base on the adjacent Tea Table Key. However, on the quiet morning of August 7, 1840, the peace shattered when a large group of Spanish Indians stealthily made their way onto Indian Key. Luckily, one vigilant resident noticed the intrusion and sounded the alarm. Out of approximately 50 inhabitants, 40 managed to escape the ensuing chaos. Tragically, Dr. Henry Perrine, a distinguished former United States consul in Campeche, Mexico, was among those who did not survive. He had been waiting on Indian Key, hoping it would soon be safe to move to a 36-square-mile grant on the mainland given to him by Congress. Meanwhile, the naval base on nearby Tea Table Key was understaffed as personnel were deployed on a mission along the southwest coast of the mainland. This left only a doctor, his patients, and five sailors led by a midshipman on the base. Despite being outnumbered, this small group attempted to fight back by mounting cannons on barges and taking aim at the attackers on Indian Key. 
The Indians retaliated and the cannon's recoil on the barges was so strong that it knocked them into the water, forcing the sailors to retreat. After the clash, the Indians didn't just leave. They ransacked Indian Key, setting fire to and looting the buildings. Back in December 1840, Colonel Harney led a group of 90 people from a place known as Fort Dallas, which is located on the Miami River. They were on a mission in the Everglades, using canoes they got from the Marines. Their guide was a man named John, who had previously been held captive by Seminole. On their journey, they encountered some local Native Americans in canoes, chased them down, caught some, and immediately executed the men by hanging. There was a moment when John found it difficult to find their way, and in an attempt to force the direction out of them, Harney threatened to hang the children of the captured Seminole women unless they showed them the way to their camp. Luckily, John figured out the way again, and they managed to locate the camp led by Chikaika and so-called Spanish Indians. Disguising themselves as Indians, Harney's soldiers surprised the camp early one morning. Chikaika was caught outside the camp, tried to run, but then stopped, offering his hand in peace, only to be shot and killed by one of the soldiers. After a brief skirmish during which some Indians managed to escape, Harney executed two captured warriors and also hung Chikaika's body. When Harney and his crew returned to Fort Dallas after a 12-day excursion, they had lost one soldier but claimed the lives of four Indians in combat and executed five others. The Florida Legislative Council later honored Harney with a commendation and a sword, and he was soon put in charge of the Second Dragoons. In another part of Florida, General Armistead had $55,000, which is about $1.7 million today, allocated for convincing chiefs to surrender. In November 1840, Armistead met with two key indigenous leaders, Thlaklo Tustanugi and Halak Tustanugi, offering them $5,000 each, equal to $115,023 today, to bring their followers in for relocation to the west and to cede land in southern Florida to those who remained. However, Colonel Ethan A. Hitchcock noted in his diary that Armistead did not follow through with these offers but rather demanded that the chiefs adhere to the terms of an existing treaty, the Payne's Landing Treaty, while also secretly deploying a force to intimidate one of the chief's people. Despite being guests of the army, the two chiefs left suddenly in the middle of the night on November 14, 1840. While some chiefs, like Echo Amathla, surrendered, others, under leaders such as Tiger Tail, did not. Kosa Tustanugi was one notable leader who accepted the $5,000 offer to relocate his 60 people. Lesser chiefs and warriors received smaller sums and additional items like rifles. Another leader, Koakuchi, utilized Armistead's negotiable stance to demand supplies and even a horse, under the pretense of surrender discussions. By spring 1841, Armistead reported relocating 450 Seminoles to the west, with another 236 waiting at Fort Brook for their turn. He estimated that around 120 warriors were transported during his command and believed that no more than 300 warriors remained in Florida. In May 1841, Halleck Tustanugi signaled his intent to surrender his band. In May of 1841, Colonel William Jenkins Worth took over as the leader of the Army forces in Florida from Armistead. Due to the war's unpopularity at home and in Congress, and its high monthly cost of $93,300 beyond regular soldier salaries, Worth had to make some cuts. He and his aide, John T. Sprague, noticed some civilians seemed to be dragging out the war to keep their jobs, leading to the dismissal of nearly 1,000 civilian army workers and a consolidation of smaller units. Worth then directed his troops on missions that resembled modern-day search-and-destroy operations, pushing the Seminoles out of their refuge in the cove of the Withlacoochee and clearing much of northern Florida. On a particular assignment on May 1, 1841, Lieutenant William Tecumseh Sherman was tasked with escorting Coacoochee to Fort Pierce for negotiations. Interestingly, Coacoochee dressed in his best attire, including a vest marked by a bullet hole in blood, and exchanged a $1 bill for silver with Sherman. At this meeting, Major Thomas Childs allowed Coacoochee 30 days to gather his people for relocation west. Despite free movement at the fort for Coacoochee's people, Childs grew suspicious of Coacoochee's intentions and eventually captured him and his followers on June 4th. Sent to New Orleans, Kokuchi and his group were ordered back to Tampa Bay by Colonel Worth, who aimed to use Kokuchi to convince remaining Seminoles to surrender. 
Colonel Worth tried to persuade Kokuchi with bribes around $8,000. With little hope for escape, Kokuchi agreed to send messages to the Seminoles to relocate west, although chiefs in the northern Florida peninsula planned to kill any messengers. Nonetheless, one messenger sent to southern chiefs was captured, but spared. These efforts led to 211 Seminoles surrendering, including many from Kokuchi's band. Moreover, a significant capture occurred at Camp Ogden, leading to easier tracking of the remaining Seminoles. By November, further efforts resulted in the surrender of some southern Seminoles. Despite these surrenders, Seminoles remained scattered throughout Florida. A starving band surrendered in northern Florida near the Apalachicola River in 1842. Elsewhere, raids continued along the St. John's River. In April 1842, First Lieutenant George A. McCall engaged Seminole warriors in the Pelchicaha Swamp, capturing Halleck Tustanugi and part of his band, demonstrating ongoing conflicts and efforts to resolve the Seminole presence in Florida. Colonel Worth suggested in early 1842 that the Seminoles could remain peacefully in southern Florida. He was later given the go-ahead to create an informal reservation in the southwest part of the state and could announce the war's end when he chose. At this time, diverse Indian bands were present in Florida, including Billy Bowlegs's Seminoles near Charlotte Harbor, Sam Jones's Miccosukis in the Everglades area close to Fort Lauderdale, a Muscogee group led by Chipko north of Lake Okeechobee, Tiger Tail's Muscogees near Tallahassee, and the Creeks led by Octiarchi in northern Florida, who had escaped from Georgia in 1836. In August 1842, the passage of the Armed Occupation Act by Congress allowed settlers to claim free land in Florida, under conditions that foreshadowed the Homestead Act of 1862. People could claim 160 acres if they improved the land and were ready to defend it, staying for five years and clearing part of it. However, claims couldn't be made close to military posts. Over 1,300 grants were issued, covering more than 210,000 acres in 1842 and 1843. The war's final conflict involved General William Bailey and Jack Bellamy's posse, tracking down and eliminating a small band of Tiger Tail's warriors in a surprise attack. William Wesley Hankins, the youngest member of the posse, was noted for the final kill of the Second Seminole War. Also, in August 1842, Worth met with Florida's Indian chiefs, offering rifles, money, and supplies for relocation west, though many preferred to stay in Florida. Believing relocation or movement to the reservation would follow, Worth declared the war over on August 14, 1842. Despite going on leave and leaving Colonel Josiah Vos in charge, ongoing attacks prompted calls for action against Indians outside the reservation. However, the decision was made to honor previous promises to the Indians. In November 1842, Worth returned, deciding that Tiger Tail and Otiarque had delayed their decisions for too long leading to Tiger Tail's capture and death in New Orleans. Other northern Florida Indians were also captured and sent west. By April 1843, only one regiment remained in Florida. By November 1843, Worth reported a small number of Indians remaining in Florida, all living on the reservation and posing no threat to settlers. Mon has pointed out that the Second Seminole War might have cost between $30 million and $40 million, but there hasn't been a detailed analysis to confirm these numbers. When Congress agreed to fund the effort to end Indian hostilities, they also included the expenses of the 1836 Creek War in the budget. An investigation into the Navy's spending revealed that approximately $511,000 went towards the war, including some suspicious purchases. For example, while the Army managed to get by with dugout canoes that cost between $10 and $15 each, the Navy ended up paying around $226 per canoe. In terms of manpower, 10,169 regular members from the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps were deployed in Florida, alongside about 30,000 militiamen and volunteers. By spring 1841, the Paymaster General reported that the United States government had paid out $2.5 million to regular Army troops and another $3.5 million to citizen soldiers for their services. When it comes to casualties, the United States Army officially counts 1,466 deaths from the Second Seminole War, mainly due to disease. The precise number of combat deaths is a bit murky. According to Mon, 328 regular Army soldiers were killed in action, 
whereas Missal points out that 269 officers and men were killed by the Seminoles, with a significant number of these occurring in three major confrontations, the Dade Massacre, Battle of Lake Okeechobee, and Harney Massacre. The Navy and Marine Corps' losses are also under some debate, with Mahone citing 69 and Missal noting 41, though acknowledging that others may have died after being relocated out of Florida due to injuries. Regarding volunteer fighters, there are conflicting reports on their deaths by Seminole hands, and the toll of disease and accidents on militiamen and volunteers remains untallied. The total number of casualties among white settlers, Seminole Indians, and black Seminoles is not definitively known. There was a report from a northern newspaper in 1839 claiming that over 80 civilians were killed by Indians in Florida that year alone. The war's impact on the Seminole and Black Seminole population was devastating, with no comprehensive record of those killed or who died from starvation or other hardships. By the end of 1843, 3,824 had been forcibly relocated to the Indian Territory and settled on Creek Reservation land, which caused further tensions. One year later, their numbers had dwindled to 3,136, and by 1962, there were 2,343 Seminoles in the Indian Territory, with possibly another 1,500 remaining in Florida. In Florida, a sense of peace was finally settling in. The majority of the Native American population had moved onto reservations, and groups of around 10 men frequently ventured into Tampa for trading purposes. However, the calm was threatened as settlers began to encroach on the reservation lands. To address this, President James Polk in 1845 set up a protective zone around the reservation, spanning 20 miles wide. Within this zone, land claims were forbidden. No ownership rights were granted and squatters would be removed by the U.S. Marshal upon request. During the same year, Thomas P. Kennedy, who ran a store at Fort Brooke, sought to tap into this new piece by transforming his fishing station on Pine Island into a trading post for the Native Americans. Unfortunately, his effort didn't pan out. Competitors sabotaged Kennedy by scaring off the Native Americans with threats of capture and relocation to the West if they patronized his trading post. Meanwhile, Florida officials were not content with this fragile peace and pushed for the complete removal of Native Americans from the state. The Native Americans, for their part, preferred to keep their interactions with white settlers to a minimum. In 1846, Captain John T. Sprague was tasked with overseeing Indian affairs in the state, a role fraught with challenges, especially when it came to gaining the trust of the Native American leaders. This distrust was deep-rooted, as the Army had a history of capturing chiefs during negotiations. Despite these hurdles, by 1847, Sprague successfully convened a meeting with all the chiefs while investigating a reported raid on a farm. Huma Sprague's investigations revealed that the Native American population in Florida comprised 120 warriors, with Billy Bowlegs leading 70 Seminoles, Sam Jones leading 30 Miccosukees, 12 Creeks, Muscogee speakers, under Chipko along with four Uchis and four Choctaws. Additionally, there were an estimated 100 women and 140 children living among them, painting a picture of the community's composition during this tense period. In 1848, a fire destroyed the trading post on Pine Island. The following year, Thomas Kennedy teamed up with John Darling to start a new trading post by Payne's Creek near the Peace River. Around that time, a group of 20 Native American warriors led by Chipko and described as outsiders because they lived off the reservation, attacked a farm north of Fort Pierce on July 12, 1849. This attack, which left one man dead and two more injured, caused many East Coast Florida residents to seek refuge in St. Augustine. A few days later, on July 17, some of these outsiders, joined by another member, targeted Kennedy and Darling's store, resulting in two deaths and two injuries. The U.S. Army found itself unprepared to counter these attacks, having limited forces in Florida and no quick way to mobilize them. The response was to increase military presence under Major General David E. Twiggs and call upon mounted volunteers for protection, while also encouraging the Native Americans to move west. Negotiations led by Captain John Casey culminated in a pledge by Billy Bowlegs, one of the Native American leaders, to surrender the attackers. Bowlegs handed over three of the five men, plus additional evidence of a fourth's fate. The fifth had been captured but escaped. However, the atmosphere soured when General Twiggs announced plans to remove the Native Americans from Florida 
using military reinforcement, financial bribes, and negotiations led by Seminole chiefs. By February 1850, 74 individuals accepted offers to relocate west, despite controversies involving involuntary departures and broken negotiations following a problematic military excursion into reservation lands. Later, in August 1850, the killing of an orphan boy by Native Americans escalated tensions, with demands from Washington for the culprit's surrender. Although Bowlegs arranged for the surrender of three men identified by Chipko, they claimed innocence and later died in a jail escape attempt under mysterious circumstances, further straining relations. Notably, the jailer had a personal vendetta linked to earlier violence at the Kennedy and Darling store hinting at a complex web of conflict and retribution between settlers and Native Americans during this period. In 1851, under orders from Thomas McKean Thompson McKinnon, the Secretary of the Interior, General Luther Blake was tasked with relocating indigenous peoples to the West. Known for having previously relocated the Cherokee from Georgia, Blake was considered well-suited for the job of moving the Seminole as well. He was given a budget to compensate each adult male with $800 and every woman and child with $450 for their relocation. Blake headed to Indian Territory to recruit interpreters before returning to Florida in March 1852. His efforts in the field to engage with indigenous leaders culminated in July with only 16 Seminole agreeing to move west. Despite facing resistance from Billy Bowlegs and others against leaving Florida, Blake managed to take Bowlegs and a few chiefs to Washington. There, President Millard Fillmore awarded Bowlegs a medal and succeeded in getting Bowlegs and three other chiefs to agree to leave Florida. Following their tour of cities like Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York City, the chiefs returned to Florida and withdrew their agreement. After this failure, Blake was dismissed in 1853 and Captain Casey resumed responsibility for the removal efforts. Meanwhile, the Florida legislature had established the role of commander of the Florida militia in January 1851. By January 1853, with the Seminole not participating in planned meetings in Washington, Governor Thomas Brown appointed General Benjamin Hopkins to the position. The militia's main task was to pursue Seminole who ventured beyond reservation lands. Before the eruption of the Third Seminole War, their actions resulted in the capture of a man, a few women, and 140 hogs, with one Seminole elder woman tragically taking her own life while in militia custody after her family had escaped. The state spent $40,000 on these operations. The inability to coax the Seminole into relocating intensified pressures on the federal government from Florida officials. Despite numerous attempts by Captain Casey to negotiate voluntary relocation, efforts were futile. Billy Bowlegs and other leaders were sent to Washington again but refused to move. In August 1854, Secretary of War Jefferson Davis launched a plan aimed at enforcing the relocation. This strategy involved implementing a trade embargo against the Seminole, surveying and selling land in southern Florida to European-American settlers, and boosting Army presence to safeguard these new settlers. Davis warned that if the Seminole refused to relocate, military force would be used. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.